Chief Femi Fanny Coyote, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Excellent, excellent. Well, I had given I this needed. big, you know, sort of introduction and then the network, as <laughs> usual, let us down. So, you, you know, and I I'm didn't so rehearse crazy. it. No, not at all, not at all. I didn't rehearse it. I'm so so to say it again, I won't be as, you know, with the same aplomb or whatever. It's but very I, kind of you. Thank you. Yes, but I must say, Lagos, I am speaking with a very special guest today, Chief Femi Fanikayade, who is also, not just a chief, he's also the former aviation minister for Nigeria. And like I said earlier, when he wasn't around, a man whose articles and whose voice you certainly want to listen to, even if you may not agree with him. And this is the thing. Okay, he's blunt, and that's what we like to do on Borderlines because today we're going to be dealing with some very, 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 very deep subjects. Anyway, can we get started? Certainly, thank you very much. And my, thanks for having me. My pleasure. You're doing a great job with your show. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for the compliment. So, on October 7th, I read your post on Instagram on October 7th you were very much bombastic and mm. clearly lambasted. Not just the actions, not just the brutality, but actually Hamas. And as you've said consistently, you were always on the side of Israel. Israel, Israel, Israel. Then we roll on a few weeks later and you write your first article on the 5th of November, where you actually address Israel directly. I'm going to read out excerpts of that, but I want you to tell us how you went from what changed from the 7th to the 5th, or sorry, yeah, the the first, the, the 5th of November. Well, thank you very much. And, and once again, I'm sorry that the show started a little bit late. I hope we'll be able to do this vast subject, um, the justice that it deserves. It's something that's very dear to my heart. And I think you're doing a wonderful job. Thank you. Um, I have always believed that a true friend speaks truth to those that they love and those that they care for. And um, that truth may cause your friend or whoever it is to chart the right and proper course once they have been advised by those that um, they know and they, you know from the records uh, over the years has always been their friend, their supporter, and indeed their defender. We've all been brought up in many ways. Those of us that 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 uh, definitely lived, um, you know, edu were educated abroad, for example, in the West, um, to support Israel. And of course, I am a Christian. I'm a, not just a, Christ a Pentecostal Christian, an evangelical Christian. And um, we are taught, as you probably know, um, you know, from birth about the importance of Israel and the vital role that it will play in the end time and how important Israel is to God. So I've always believed that. I've always been, to, I've also attended Bible seminary. So you know how I must feel about Israel. Um, and that is why um, when Israel was attacked in a brutal fashion on October the 7th, um, the whole world, whether Christian, Muslim, whatever you are, everybody rose up and condemned this heinous action by Hamas which is a group that I've always condemned, as I've condemned Islamist groups all over the world, including in Nigeria, uh, including other parts of the world. I think it's condemnable. I've never been a supporter of Hamas. I think Hamas is an evil organization. And certainly Hamas um, is not a friend to humanity. That is my view, and that has always been my view. So what, what, when what happened on October the 7th happened, um, it didn't come as a surprise to many of us, because that's the nature of these people. I'm talking about Hamas. Uh, but it happened, and it was barbaric. We'd never seen anything like it, and every right-thinking person in the world surely would condemn such barbarity. Now, one barbarity does not justify another. You ask me why I had to tell the ones I love, the ones I've always believed in and defended the truth. A few weeks later, what we saw unfolding was this, and we were all angry when October 7th took place. We all said all sorts of things. Little did we know that Israel and those that are in charge of Israel didn't just say these things. They actually meant them, and they were going to affect them. And what happened over the next few weeks? We witnessed it on television, live, as they say, where thousands of children, thousands of women, thousands of uh, buildings, thousands of infrastructures, not of Hamas, because babies are not members of Hamas. Women in the majority are not members of Hamas. Innocent individuals, including health workers, including 
uh, World Health Organization workers, including school teachers, including hospital workers, ambulances targeted, hospitals targeted, slaughtered by Israeli bombs. This is what we witnessed day in, day out. And it became very clear that this was not just a question of fighting Hamas or eliminating Hamas, which I think most people are in agreement with. This was an opportunity that presented itself to the extremists in Israel and the ex extremists amongst the Zionist state and the Jewish right-wing fringe to totally eliminate those people that live in the Gaza Strip and essentially to wipe out the Palestinian race. And that's exactly what I'm seeing here. Now, when I started my series against what was going on in Gaza, a lot of people were, were surprised, understandably. But as time went by, with what we were seeing on television, every key person that I know, including those that loved Israel at one point or the other, has condemned this. And if you look at what's happening with Western government at the beginning, they were in total support of Israel. And of course, I'm talking about America, the UK, and a number of others. First to break ranks was France. Then eventually, thankfully, a few days ago, the British also condemned what was going on, or rather said it was too much killing, uh, thankfully. The Germans said the same things. Even Biden, Biden's America, said the same thing, that the killing is just too much. We have never seen anything like this literally in the history of the world, where you can watch the slaughter of women and children wholesale, free of charge, on television, from your bedroom, and we're expected to clap for them. Now, to back that up, some mm -hmm. of the statements that the Israeli leaders have been making only confirms the fact, or the suggestion, that they want to eliminate an entire people. This is nothing but genocide. It is nothing but ethnic cleansing. It is nothing but barbarity in its worst form. And I would never support that as a human being, as a Christian, and as somebody that knows that God will not allow the killing of innocent people simply because you feel enraged. And that's why I changed. And since that time, um, I consider it to be as a matter of duty to speak up against what I consider to be evil in this matter. And everything about it is evil. It's not just about what they're doing. It's about what their intentions are. It's about the history of the whole conflict, because I did a lot of research. I went back. I went back to the drawing board and I realized that, okay, why did Hamas behave like this? October, and I'm not justifying that behavior, but October the 7th took place. You can't take it in isolation. These are a people that have been occupied for so many years, for 75 years. They were removed from their land. They were occupied. They were tormented. They were killed. They were slaughtered. They were defeated. People that have no state of their own, women and children, no country of their own. And the whole world literally turned their back on them. Yes, of course, people tried their best. Well, Israel always had the best of it all. At every point in time, they were the underdogs. And now we're expected to believe that they don't matter. It's okay for us to sit down and watch a whole race being eliminated, being driven into the sea or the desert, or, be, or, 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 or being, as one of the ministers in Israel said, the minister, uh, the uh, minister for heritage in Israel said they should just nuke the whole place, drop a, nu drop a nuclear bomb on on Gaza and kill every single Palestinian. We, this is a civilized world. We want peace, we want decency, we want justice. And if we want peace, if we want justice, then we must give justice to the Palestinian people. And we have constantly called upon Israel to cease fire and stop this nonsense. They did it for four days. They, 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 they continued after that. And now they're even killing their own citizens who are hostages in the hands of Hamas. They're also bombing cemeteries. They're bombing everything in sight. And this is unacceptable. And every right person, the, every right thinking person ought to speak out against it. There are several paragraphs that you write that I really want to read out. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to, but I'm going to try. You wrote, and I, and, and I like the way you spaced them out. It, it's almost like a verse. Um, mm. You wrote, blessing and love in Israel does not involve encouraging them to wipe out a whole race. Blessing and love in Israel does not involve supporting them to kill every Palestinian in the Gaza Strip in the name of eliminating Hamas. Blessing and love in Israel means encouraging them to fight their enemies and defend themselves in a dignified and civilized way by abiding by the, by the laws of war, armed conflict, by honoring the rules of engagement and by working within the structures and framework of international law whilst in the field of battle. You continued, mm. blessing and love in Israel does not mean we should support them to target and kill every Muslim and Christian man, woman and child in Gaza. 
blessing and loving Israel does not mean we should sit by silently and watch them turn into monsters that the German Nazis who murdered six million of their people in the gas chambers during World War II. Blessing and loving Israel does not mean supporting its every action even when it is wrong. Blessing and loving Israel does not mean saying no to humanitarian pauses and the ground offensive and bombing or ceasefire in order to get the wounded out and sending much needed food and medical supplies. Blessing and loving Israel does not mean we should lose our humanity, our compassion, our decency and our sense of reasoning. Blessing and love in Israel does not mean supporting the Israeli Knesset who have said the 2.5 million Palestinians who live in Gaza should either be killed or relocated to 100 different countries at the rate of 25,000 Palestinians per country. Blessing and love in Israel does not mean that we should espouse the hateful philosophy and satanic spirited spirit of apartheid which we as Africans spent so many decades opposing and resisting in South Africa. Blessing and love in Israel means admonishing, admonishing them to be accommodating, flexible, kind, calm, compassionate, restrained, rational, reasonable, level-headed, and loving, even where and when they have been badly hurt and gravely wounded as they were on the 7th of October. Blessing and loving Israel means encouraging them to fight their enemies and defend themselves in a dignified and civilized way by abiding with the laws of war, armed conflict, by honoring the rules of engagement and by working within the structures and framework of international, of, uh, the framework of international law whilst in the field of battle. You end the blessings with blessing and loving Israel means encouraging the Jews and giving them hope and support in their time of need, reminding them to have faith in God and admonishing them to be righteous in all their ways. I found those verses very, very, very powerful because here's the thing. There's a conflation between Israel, the Judaism, the religion, Jewish, the people, and Zionists, or Zionism. And I'd like you, because you clearly do love Israel, you clearly do want to speak truth to power, not just want to, you do. I can imagine Netanyahu sitting in front of you right now. As I said to somebody when I was in Israel, if Golda Meir was alive, she would have thrown a chicken soup over his head and said, what the heck are you doing? Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. so, so, and that's what I hear from you. So talk to us about that conflation where you can love Israel, but resent what Israel is doing. Okay. Thank you very much. And thanks for quoting from, from my article. I think it's, it was titled The Butchery in Gaza, which that's I wrote right. a few weeks back. Yes. And uh, I really appreciate that. I spoke from, from the heart and um, I, I, I'm also interested in what you just said about me sitting, if I'm in front of it, and Yahweh, no, you're absolutely right about Golda Meir. She was a wonderful lady. She had compassion. And she certainly would have told off people like Benjamin Netanyahu uh, 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 and put them in their place. Interestingly, I've written a letter, which I'll quote from later, an open letter to the President of Israel. Um, you know, I think I finished it two days ago, and it will be out sometime next week for the public, and I'll publish it. But going to your question now, it's a very good question, an interesting question. You see, what's happening here is this. Let me start by telling you that a large number of Jewish people, the more traditional ones, the Torah Jews and so many others, um, what people call the most conservative form of Judaism, um, are actually against what Netanyahu is doing and actually do not believe in this expansionist idea of a greater Israel where Israel will just simply expand its borders back to biblical days uh, and, and try to gobble up all the countries around around her literally from Egypt up to Lebanon up until literally the borders of Iran which is really what the vision of a greater Israel is which is really what some of these people I think like like Netanyahu want to do there is a distinction between Judaism which is a faith that has suffered for many years, a great faith, a noble faith, 
with noble people who have been badly treated by the rest of the world for so many uh, hundreds of years, literally thousands of years. There's a distinction between that group of people and the people that are running Israel today. Zionism is a completely different thing to Judaism, totally different. Zionism is a concept that came into being in the late 19th century. I, I believe the man's name was Hegel. I've forgotten his name. Hudson. He created it. Hudson, Hudson. that's it. He yeah. created it. Absolutely. I wrote about it in one of my essays and yes, he, 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 he created it. He established it. And um, he, he's the one that enunciated it. And what does it mean? Essentially what Zionism means is this, that as far as they're concerned, the Jewish people are the master race, God's chosen people, number one. Number two, they're entitled to have not just what they have today uh, as, 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 as Israel, but literally all the countries around it to establish what was once the kingdom of Israel under King David, uh, under all the great kings of Israel, and even more than that, okay? They also believe that they must use politics to enhance the philosophy and the belief of apartheid, the system of apartheid. That is to say, every single non-Jew, every single non-Israeli, every single person that is an Arab, that is a black person, that is not, uh, that is not part of them, is not really fit to be treated in a humane and decent manner, and actually are somehow subhuman. Now, you would say to me, well, these people essentially are from that place. Well, listen, let me put this to you, that 2,000 years ago, they were there. The Jews were there. There's no doubt about that. Now, for some reason, they were scattered all over the earth. They went away for 2,000 years. Other people were living in that area for that 2,000 years. Palestine came into being. It became a British colony later. But it came into being, and there were people there, Semitic people, living there. 2,000 years later, you now come back simply because the world killed so, the Germany killed so many of you, the world treated you so badly, that the West collectively felt there was a sense of guilt that they had to find your homeland, a homeland for you, to go back to and to live there, okay? To make, you know, to satisfy their own sense of conscience and decency, and also to make up for what uh, the Germans had done to you. They killed six million people and millions of others were killed by non-Germans, okay, throughout the century. So they, they decided, look, we need to do something for these people. And what happens? Where do we put them? There was a very strong argument. And in fact, the gentleman you mentioned earlier, the first choice that they had was actually Uganda. That, look, let's take them to Uganda. It almost came to that. Uganda in Africa. But ultimately they said, no, let's take them to Israel where they have roots and they can reclaim the land. And they went there. And when they got there, imagine those that have been there for 2,000 years are now met with people who say, listen, we own this land. You have to get out of this land. We must dominate you. We must overcome you. We must subject you to our will. And we must keep you firmly under us in the name of Zionism because we are the master race. How do you expect the Palestinians and the Arabs to feel about that? Of course they would resist it. But that's essentially what happened. And now what happened? It was a legitimate aspiration to have a Jewish state. There's nothing wrong with that as long as they're prepared to live in peace with those who are already there and we're prepared to tolerate and accept everybody else, just as we expect the Arabs to tolerate them too. But what happens? Zionism would manifest itself in the hearts and minds of those that join parties like the Likud Party in Israel and also the right-wing, extreme right-wing Zionists. And they said, listen, we must take this land. Everybody below us, the Arabs and everybody else are below us and we must subjugate them. And they entrench what is established is essentially an apartheid state in the Middle East, where the Israelis were the only ones that mattered, nobody else mattered. Now, let me tell you what is particularly disturbing about this. And I'm about to tell you something which, uh, it's, in my, it's in my open letter, I, I, I spoke about it extensively there, but, but it, it's really something a lot that's lost in a lot of people. Let me tell you this, when you say people are anti-Semitic, what people don't realize is the real Semites, the Semitic people are the Arabs and the Palestinians that are living there, not the Jews. And look at the leadership of the Jews. Look at the leadership of Israel. Just study it. These people are essentially Europeans that came from Europe maybe a, a generation or two ago. They went back there, and they're basically Europeans, all of them, from Netanyahu, Bibi Netanyahu, to every single one of them. Even as going back as far back as Benachim Begin, and all the rest of Ariel Sharon, they all have a root, either in Eastern Europe, Western yeah. Europe, or elsewhere. So essentially, these people are European Jews. And they are the people that have come to take control of that area, subjugate everybody else, declare themselves as the master race in the name of their faith. And they're now pushing a political agenda to ensure that they are in full control. And of course, they have the full backing, 
with unconditional backing of, of America and the majority of the countries in the West. That And the reason they're doing that, I will put it to you today, is because essentially they are the same people. Uh, the Americans, the Europeans, and the Jews that are leading Israel today are essentially Caucasians who have their roots in the old Europe and who want to now have a, a seat of power in the Middle East to ensure that their will is done and to ensure that everybody else is subjugated and everybody else is held down. And that really is the problem. Now, let me tell you, if I were a Palestinian, I really don't think I'd sit at home and say, well, no, it's okay for you to kill our children. It's okay for you to kill our women. It's okay for you to subjugate us for 75 years and tell us that we don't exist and that we have no right, and that we never existed, and that we don't have any history. It's, it's, it's okay. I wouldn't say that. You wouldn't say that. If they killed, God forbid, our loved ones, you wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that. These people have been subjected to the most horrible form of bondage and subjugation for many, many years. And it's time for the world to wake up, given what we're seeing now, to argue and stand for justice and fairness and a much more balanced approach to this whole matter. As we speak today, Israel feels they can do anything and get away with it. Then they're doing it with total and complete impunity. They're boasting about it. Now, if I may, if I don't, if you don't mind, can I just read a Go little ahead. portion of this open letter? Go ahead. Um, the president of Israel will get this in a matter of days, and it'll be all over the public space in a matter of days. I'll just cut the chase and get to the, the relevant part to show you the level of damage that these people have done in case some of your listeners don't fully appreciate it. Now, I've, I've said, I've started, but let me get to the paragraphs that are relevant. I said here, your killing spree, I'm talking to him now, Netanyahu, your killing spree, genocidal binge, murderous disposition, blind rage, an unconscionable desire to wipe out, ethnically cleanse, and totally eliminate the entire Palestinian race, has resulted in the mass murder of 26,000 innocent and defenseless Palestinians, which represents over 1% of the entire population of Gaza. 97 journalists, including Samir Abu Dhaka of Al Jazeera, and three Israeli hostages, whilst they were shirtless, begging for help, and waving a white flag in Gaza, all in just two months. Of the 26,000 Palestinians that have been killed, 10,000 of them were children, and 6,400 of them were women, and no less than 20,000 were above the rubble, whilst over 6,000 6, of them remain below it. That's 20,000 above 6,000 below. Outside of that 24,000 Palestinian outside of that 24,000 Palestinian children have lost one or both parents in his in Israeli attacks and 18,000 have been injured with some in critical condition while 60% of the people of Gaza are facing starvation of a truth it is only those who do not have children that cannot feel the pain of the Palestinian people 300 Palestinian health workers, 134 staffers of the United Nations, and a French foreign ministry official have been killed, and 1.9 million Gazans have been displaced. Hundreds of thousands of them are without food, clean water, and shelter, and 85% of them have been forced to, to leave their homes. I'm going on. Worse still, 288 Palestinians have been killed in the neighboring occupied bank, whilst 4,700 whilst 4,570 have been detained. Oh, my God. Whilst 4,750 have been detained. Am I still with you? You're yes, still with I can me. hear you. Whilst yes. 4,570 have been detained there since October the 7th. In addition to this, 100,000 buildings have been destroyed in Gaza. Thousands of refugees have been bombed and butchered in its numerous refugee camps. And a Palestinian woman and her daughter were targeted and shot dead in a church by an Israeli sniper. The latter is a particularly despicable and heinous crime, which Pope Francis has described as an act of terrorism. 12,000 bombs. Can I go on? Yes, please go ahead. Can I go on? We have listeners yes, 12, from abroad bombs. who are trying to call by Skype. Please go ahead. All right. 12,000 bombs and 40,000 tons of bombs have been dropped on Gaza, and half of all its buildings have been totally destroyed, whilst your air force says it struck at least 12,000 targets across the besieged Palestinian territory between October the 7th and November the 1st alone. Only God knows how high that number is today, making it one of the most intense bombing campaigns in recent history. I'm going on. As Christmas approaches, Bethlehem, birthplace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, is under siege, and you have decided to sacrifice and forsake the remaining 130 hostages that are still with Hamas. All this led to Mustafa Bakuti, a former minister of information in the Palestinian UDD government and a member of the Palestinian Legislative Council to say no human being in Palestine has any value to Israel, whether Muslim or Christian. The whole world knows how it treats Palestinians, 
how how it treats Palestinians and why it is killing journalists that are and why it is killing journalists that are reporting the truth. I I'll stop here where I just ask one question and I'll say, can you dispute Mustafa's words? Now it goes on. It's a very four, it's a four thousand word um uh, uh, letter and, and 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 by I'm sure this week Sunday onwards it'll come out in the public realm. But you know this this shows you just how serious the situation that we're in. And I think that it's incumbent upon each and every one of us to keep reminding others, keep, keep telling the world that these people are human beings. They're not animals. Now, I am talking about the Palestinian people. I'm talking about those both in Gaza and on the West Bank. If you say Hamas is your target, why are you killing women and children in, the, the, in, in Gaza? If you say Hamas is your target, why are you targeting innocent women and children? Hundreds of people, thousands perhaps, have been slaughtered even in Gaza and detained. And settlers, that is Israeli settlers in Gaza, are going into areas they're not supposed to go in, demarcated areas for the Palestinians, building their homes, and your minister of national security is giving them weapons to kill local Palestinians in the West Bank, where Gaza doesn't exist. What's going on here is you have a rogue state that has lost its, lost its mind, is in the power of Zionism, is totally possessed, and is set to wipe out the people. And here we are watching that and acting as if it's normal. It is not normal, it is unacceptable, and we must resist it. Indeed. One of the things that I really like that you mentioned is the connection to Europe and the fact that fundamentally the reason yep. Israel is able to get away with this is because yes. practically... Every Israeli that has returned to Israel is from Europe or America. Absolutely. Incidentally, Absolutely. You got it. Yeah, I, I want us to talk about the colonialism. What most people also don't realize is that it was Europe who began anti-Semitic actions. It was Europe who expelled and ethnic cleansed the Jews from Europe. Absolutely. That's what triggered Absolutely. the, you know, the, the birth of Zionism. And all of that Absolutely. happened prior to 1917. Yep. And I'm going to put this to you. Do you agree that Balfour's declaration of 1917, you know, which was, you know, from Rothschild, etc., etc., was their way, two things. One, their way of stopping Jews from coming to Britain, number one. Number two, Europe's way of, you know, sort of paying for their guilt. What are your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. The, the, the first, you're absolutely right. They, they they wanted the Jews out. They'd been slaughtered. And, and not just, you know, the, the Russians. I mean, honestly, they really went through hell. And, you know, some say, well, it's as a consequence of the judgments they brought upon themselves after the killing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, where they said that, you know, that let this, let the sins and let the curse be upon us and our children. But, you know, if you look at the history of the Jews, it really is tragic what has happened to them. And But they were subjected to more tyranny and subjugation and wickedness by the Europeans than any other race on earth. I mean, the Europeans, you know, were, were, they killed them like flies. And, and you know the funny thing? Most of Europe actually had no problem with what Adolf Hitler was doing to the Jews. In fact, there was a very strong argument in the UK to actually support Adolf Hitler during the Second World War and not get involved in the war at all. The same with America. There was a strong body of opinion that believed that. But the truth is that the Europeans tormented and killed them more than... So they really did want to... Look, let's just get rid of this problem. Hitler went beyond the pale, gas six million of them. I mean, this is something we just cannot defend before the world. And, um, and, and therefore, we need to ensure that we find somewhere for them them to go so they can just continue whatever it is they're doing there and you know they resented them for also having uh the 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 the, the skill of controlling international financing which is where the Rothschilds and things come in I'll come into, I'll come to that in a minute so they resented them like Hitler said it openly that the Jews control everything we want them out we want to kill them so they decide look push them to Israel there'll be less of a problem for us and we'll be able to now assuage our sense of guilt for what we've been doing to them over so many centuries you know, but but the truth of the matter is that talking about Rothschild now and Balfour, the reality is this: that the Rothschilds literally own Israel, and 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 Balfour literally gave them uh, Israel. It was a brainchild of the Rothschilds. It was a gift to the Rothschild family, and it was something that. And you know, I don't want to say too much about them at this stage. But if you look at the history, if you know anything about the Illuminati, if you know anything about the what they call the Great Reset. And if you, if you know what's really going on in the world, you know that there's a lot more to this than meets the eye. 
And what is happening here, or what has happened here, is that the Rothschilds were given this state, they were given free license to do anything they want with this state and establish a, a, a power and super hegemonic power state in the Middle East to ensure that from there certain things will happen in the world which are yet to unfold. I have no doubt whatsoever that if we're not careful, World War Three will be sparked off with the activities of the Middle East. Now, let me say this to you, let me say this to you clearly. I do not believe as a Christian, I do not believe that Israel can ever be overcome. I do, however, have the right to say, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. I have every right to say that. And when I say that, I don't mean that the Jews must be killed, or the Zionist state must be wiped away, or that Zionism as a concept is something that must be banned. They can be as Zionist as they want, but they should keep it to themselves. What I mean when I say that is that the Palestinian people, just as the Jews, have every right to be free, have every right to have their own state, and have every right, and have every right to live and be recognized as human beings. The Jews of the Israeli state, Netanyahu and the right-wingers have now literally ruled out the possibility of a two-state solution. Now, if you say there will not be a two-state solution, what you're saying is essentially what Hamas is also saying, that the Palestinians have no right to a nation of their own, they are not going to live in peaceful coexistence with them, and they are, as, as far as they're concerned, they will wipe them out if they insist on doing so. That's no different to what Hamas is saying when they say Israel does not have a right to exist. So we, we have a real mess on our hands, but it's a well-constructed mess, which the West knows all about, and, 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 and which is contrived, and there's a purpose to it. And that purpose is to take us to the edge of a major conflict in the world. And sadly, I see that unfolding now. If this madness continues, and if it doesn't stop, like I argued in one of my earlier essays, What's going to happen next? It's very obvious. The Muslim world will not sit by and allow this to continue for much longer. You don't expect Egypt, even if the leadership wanted it to continue and wanted to keep the peace, the followership in Egypt will not accept it. The followership in the Arab Gulf states will not accept it. The followership in Iran will not accept it. The followership in, in, in Turkey, particularly Turkey, will not accept it. The followership in places like Yemen, and they will not accept it. And eventually, what will happen? is that they will all come together with a clear plan and purpose to say, we are going to attempt to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. And you must also remember that the Russians, the Russians are solidly with the Iranians. New alliances will be formed. Turkey is the most sec has the second largest army in NATO, and it's an exceptionally uh, powerful army. And apart from that, Turkey doesn't have nuclear weapons. Israel does, but they have made a pledge. Pakistan has made a pledge that if Israel uses nuclear weapons against Turkey or any other Muslim country, they will step in and use nuclear weapons against Israel. So you see what's unfolding here. Hezbollah is exceptionally powerful, you know, and you have the Mehdi army in Iraq. You have people that have this passion to fight for their rights as Muslims, as Muslims all over the Middle East. And if I were a Muslim, I would feel exceptionally passionate about this. But I'm not. I'm a Christian. And therefore, I have compassion. And I have decency. And I believe that even where your friend, the Jews that we were taught to love and we were taught to support, even though they hate most of us and they're killing our own people too, when they go wrong, we are the first to speak out and say no. I know the history. I know what happened in Lebanon. I know what happened in the, in, in, in the refugee camps of, of, of Shaba and Shatila when the Christian phalange of the Lebanese killed hundreds of thousands of innocent uh, Muslim refugee, uh, refugees in, in, in those two refugee sites. And I know that Israel backed it. All sides have committed atrocities. The Jews have done it, the Christians have done it, the Muslims have done it. But it's a time to stop these atrocities, for all of us to come together in peace, recognize that we have the right to exist, love one another, understand one another, and work together for an expected end, for a better world. That's my position and will always be. We're about to go on a break, but I'm going to throw this at you. And when you come back, I want you to expatiate on it for us. Like you've rightly said, you know, I, I think in fact, what I should say is for a long time, Israel, namely Benjamin Netanyahu, has been pushing and sort of, you know, prodding America to go against Iran, wanting them to confront each other. Israel right now, is losing the war or is or is israel not losing the war i'd like you to talk to us about that and number one number two is america the u.s biden blinken and the rest of the gang they are increasingly more and more isolated 
yes. on the wrong side of history, as some would say. So we're going to go on a quick break. When we come back, I'd like you to expand on that for us, please. Right. We'll be Thanks right so back. Much. Just a few okay. seconds. Okay. But the number one talk station of Lagos is closer to you than ever. Join the conversation online or on the go. Be part of the Info family on our user-friendly mobile app and website for a better and improved listening experience. Download the app from Google Play Store and App Store with super efficient and clean audio quality. Welcome to NigeriaInfo.fm. Watch us live on YouTube and Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at NigeriaInfo.fm and Instagram at NigeriaInfo.fm. Lagos 99.3 Nigeria Info. Let's, Let's talk. Welcome back, Lagos, Nigeria. We are still on borderlines. And my guest, Chief Femi... Fa Look, if you haven't been listening, I can't help you. You just have to just stay close. I mean, this is deep. This is as educative as you want. And you people better not be asking me silly questions after this, because if you're not listening, you're on your own. Sir, go ahead. Um, I don't want to waste your time. What I said earlier before we went on break... Oh, you're muted. Am I, is he muted? Don't know. You're not. Go ahead. No, I'm, I'm, I think that was our side. Yeah. Could yes. you just quickly repeat the first the first stanza of that? You asked me about whether Israel. there'll be a is, war. Yeah. Is yeah. Israel losing this war or is Israel winning the war? I mean, Israel would say we've killed seven thousand Hamas no, no. operatives, but no. we know there's over forty thousand. Okay. No. Look. Look. How do you assess whether or not they're winning or, or losing the war? Number one, they have not achieved their strategic objectives. Even their, even their tactical objectives have not been achieved, which is to eliminate Hamas. If they themselves are saying they've only killed seven or 8,000 members of Hamas, and they themselves said there are 30,000 uh, foot soldiers in Hamas, they've only killed 7,000, assuming they're even telling us the truth, okay? And that means they have, they're nowhere near achieving their objectives. Secondly, what have they managed to do? Go to Europe, go to America, go to the Western world, go all over the world. You have hundreds of thousands, in some cases millions, of people, not I'm not talking about the Arab world or the Muslim world. I'm talking about the Western world and in Africa and places like that. You have millions of people marching the streets, wearing the colors of the Palestinian flag, calling and chanting for freedom for Palestine. This has never happened before. It's never happened. And what's happening now is that the people in these countries, that is the ordinary people that have a very keen sense of justice, are saying enough is enough with this barbarity and have changed sides and are supporting the cause of Palestinian liberation, something that they would never have done 10, 20, 30 years ago. I've heard of at that time. It's a new generation. And, and in the same way that my generation fought against uh, apartheid, uh, in, 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 in apartheid, white minority rule South Africa, is what is happening today throughout the world. The younger people are fighting against, are speaking and protesting against the subjugation of the Palestinian people. And what is going on now is that Western governors are beginning to understand that if we're not careful, we will lose elections based on this issue alone. So the Israeli lobby in the West has weakened, it, it has weakened considerably. And the push for unconditional support for Israel, no matter what they do, even if they killed millions of innocent people, um, you know, is, is beginning to now regress and they're thinking twice about it. So they have lost in the sense that they have lost support, they are losing support, they're losing backing, and even their closest friends like Biden's America are saying, listen, this is too much for us to bear. We may end up losing the next election if we continue to allow this. And I thank God for Al Jazeera. I thank God for people like yourself. I thank God for so many mediums throughout the world that are telling us the truth, speaking about this with an open mind. I mean, even Piers Morgan, for goodness sake, despite the fact that he was so rapidly pro-Israel, um, pro, pro uh, has now begun to retrace his steps to say, listen, this is a bit much. It shouldn't be allowed to go on. Mm -hmm. So to that extent, they have lost the war. Not only that, when your partner or your backer, which is America, starts telling you things like, listen, you're going too far publicly, and telling you things like that the American Minister of Defense said that, um, that you know, you may have won the strategic, the, the, 
the tactical war, but you will end up losing the strategic one if you continue this way. They are already sending signals to them. And I'll tell you why else they lost the war. And we need to, this, what I'm about to tell you now, I, I, it's my instinct. I'm just, just saying this Please and I ahead. believe it to be true. Mm -hmm. How do you think, for goodness sake, Hamas managed to penetrate what the Israelis and Jews call the Iron Dome? Could it have been by their own technology and knowledge? I doubt it very much. I suspect strongly that one of the world's one of the world's two or three superpowers, I won't I won't mention which country that I believe it was, gave them the technology to avoid that. Now, what does that tell you? That tells you that the Palestinian people are no longer alone. We know that Iran is with them. We know that Russia is with them. We know that Turkey is with them. We know that um, uh, uh, China has uh, has encouraged them to stand firm. We know, and these are the world's emerging powers. We know that Brazil is with them. We know that South Africa is with them. We know that these countries are with them. Now, when you're talking about winning or losing, it's no longer a case that it's a unipolar world where the Americans tell everybody to go and jump in a lagoon. You have to jump in a lagoon. There is a new axis now, an unwinding one, a beautiful one in my view, that has made the world a much more serious place where the Americans can't just through their allies or through their acolytes kick everybody around. And these guys are firmly on the side of Palestinian liberation. I'm not saying they're on the side of Hamas, but certainly they believe in freedom for the Palestinian people. Okay. So the Israelis have failed to appreciate just how serious the situation they're in. They're in a no-win situation. They've killed too many people. There's too much blood in their hands. People have condemned them. And until they stop and effect a ceasefire and withdraw and stop killing innocent civilians, they will lose the war more and more each day until it comes to end. And most importantly, they have engendered a situation where Foreign powers are now gathering and speaking and saying, listen, sooner or later, we're going to have to come together and resist this wickedness yeah. and stand against it. Yeah. And when that happens, I, I really will think it is only God that can then protect and then save the nation of Israel. And I, and I pray they are saved. I don't want them wiped away. I believe that they have the right to exist, but I believe that this is not the way to ensure that uh, you, 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 you sustain that right Gosh. Or, or validate that how I wish we had more time. Oh, gosh, this is so you unfair. Thought, you know, you had a second part of that question. <laughs> like a quick yes, on that. yes, but I, I also want your thoughts on, okay. on, on the sort of, if I could call it, and, and I'm trying to think of a nice word, but this is what keeps coming to me. The seeming impotence of African countries, right, with regards to this genocide. Mm. And Why? The quietness, okay, you know, we've had South Africa, um, I think we've got the Algerians condemn it, and, you know, Absolutely. the Egyptian, but but yeah. African countries, and even Nigeria, oh. although Nigeria went to the Arab League and, they, you know, they said they support a two-state solution, they're clearly on the side of, 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 of Palestine, but they haven't condemned it. Where does that impotence come from? Oh, we so well, don't that, That's time. a very good question. We have like three minutes. Over to you. Okay, let, let me quickly address that. I, I, yeah. Can, should I proceed? Go ahead. Go okay. ahead. Go ahead. Let, let me address that. I mean, I, I think it's, um, it's, it's probably a failing of us all as a people um, that we cannot stand on the side of truth. After all, others stood with us in our time of need. And I think it's a tragedy of monumental proportions that our country, for example, did not condemn Number one, the killing of, 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 of Jews on October the 7th. They didn't say a word. They just said there should be restraint on both sides. And they did not condemn what I consider to be genocide. In fact, the world considers to be genocide in uh, uh, Gaza today. And I think it's about time that we, we, you know, we, we took a stand on these issues. Nigeria, for example, should not be led by South Africa in matters of honesty and matters of justice. We should be the leader. We should take the lead in black Africa, not South Africa. And we have failed in that respect, I have to say. We need a virile, strong foreign yeah. policy. We don't need to be intimidated by the Americans. I've never, never been one that supports American imperialism or American or American hegemony. I've always supported the Russians, for example. I'm well known for that. Um, you know, I, I understand world politics very, very well. And I have no fear whatsoever about the implications of that. Our country is a big country, 200 million people. We have Muslims in this country, 50% of the population. Christians, the other 50%. And we should be able to come together and say with one voice that when Christians and Muslims are being slaughtered anywhere in the world by Jews or by Zionists, we as a country should be able to stand up and say, we will not accept this. Now, of course, the Americans will tell us, please take it easy. And so will the Brits. 
But we don't have that affinity with Israel the way in which these people do. We don't have that history with Israel. We are independent thinkers, we are highly educated people, and we ought to do more and ought to do better. Most African countries do not have the wherewithal, the strength, or the courage of the Nigerian. Well, we have it. And therefore, when we don't express it in foreign policy, there is absolutely no excuse for it. And I've done all I can. I, I, I you know, I, I've spoken to a number of people within this administration and administration that I support and I help to put in power. And I'm very proud of this uh, 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 Bola Tinumbo administration. We are working day and night to encourage our president and our government to do the right thing and stand on the right side of history and ensure that we stand up against those that are committing genocide, ethnic cleansing and mass murder. And by God's grace, we will do that and play our role in international affairs on the world stage on this issue. Chief Femi Fanny Kayode. I'm going to try and pronounce this now. The Sodok, the Sadwa Kin Shinkafi. Sadao Kin Shinkafi. <laughs> of, of where? So the Sadao Shin Shinkafi is of where? Shinkafi is a beautiful ancient town okay. in, uh, in Zamfara State. This Excellent. is part of the Tokuto Caliphate. Yeah. Okay. And the former Minister of Aviation and former Minister of Culture tourism in nigeria i so have to have you back good god we could have spoken for a whole hour Absolutely. and it's still i mean Absolutely. two hours it still wouldn't be long <laughs> enough so thank you so so very much thank you thank you, so. thank you for giving up thank your you, time for sharing your knowledge for sharing your my thoughts pleasure. with us all the best sir my pleasure you're most welcome. And thanks for having me. Look forward to the letter on Sunday. I will. An open letter to be. And then you'll okay. come back to talk about it. Sure, definitely. Thanks, eh? Thank All you, All the sir. best. Merry you Christmas. Bye-bye.